So welcome. My name is Dawn, as, as you know, uh, some of you know. I'm the executive director here at the uh, Roach Jones Duff House and Garden Museum. And I am here at the House and Garden Museum, um, physically here. This is uh, our last history happy hour of the season. We're taking a break for summer and actually starting June, we have a lot of events happening here on site. So we're moving outside into the garden where I know a lot of people still feel more comfortable outside. Um, we've got a bunch of events scheduled from concerts um, actually with the, our very own speaker. Um, a concert is coming up in June to theater productions and, um, and kind of open house days. So we hope that you'll come back for more events here at the RJD. I'm going to put the calendar link in the chat a little bit later so you can see what we have going on here. So um, come back, come often, come enjoy the garden. The roses bloom usually in, uh, we think maybe early June this year because they're looking really good. So you gotta come back to see the roses. Um, I also want to thank you for attending. We've got some board members on this, um, on this webinar today. Thank you to my board for attending. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Since it is such a beautiful day, it might be that much harder to be inside on your computer. So I appreciate you coming. Um, and I want to mention that the last thing I will put in the chat is um, we have been doing more than half of our programs for free here this year, our virtual programs. Others, we've made a suggested donation. So if you'd like to donate anything towards uh, future programming, we're always happy to have a, even a, a small donation. I'll put the link into the chat to do that. So um, with that, this is History of Happy Hour after all. And um, I like to say we start with the happy part. Um, I'm going to introduce our first speaker is Jonathan, Jonathan the Cocktail Guru. Um, he is one of the most premier cocktail consultants and bartenders for restaurants in spirit companies. His signature cocktails can be seen and enjoyed in many of North America's most upscale cocktail lounges and restaurants. With nearly 20 years experience in the hospitality industry, Jonathan shares his insights with the most influential publications from around the world. And he contributes his unique talents to morning television shows and national radio. Jonathan has appeared on such programs as NBC's Weekend Today in New York and Fox and Friends. Um, and so I'm going to turn things over to him. Jonathan, you have the spotlight. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Again, as Don was saying, this is my third time making a cocktail for the History Happy Hour, and it's been really amazing. And I am drawing inspiration from the featured artwork from the Roach Jones Duff House. Uh, so that is very exciting. And yes, I am not a um, local. I am from New Jersey, and I moved here um, when my wife and I got married. And she is from Dartmouth. So we live in Dartmouth now. We have two kids. Um, Locally, some local projects that I've worked on pre-pandemic. Uh, I helped open up the bar at uh, Little Moss in Padenarum, and I did some projects out on the vineyard, helping um, these bars and restaurants open up and designing their beverage programs and training their staff and following up. I did uh, Cultivator Shoals in New Bedford downtown when they opened, and then I helped uh, Steve Silverstein with the Black Whale and Not Your Average Joe's uh, and a couple other places. I'm also helping the folks right now from DNB, kitchen uh, and they're opening their new uh, fresh sustainable seafood restaurant uh, right next door to Cultivator Shoals uh, called New Bedford Flats. So um, without further ado what I'd like to do is make this cocktail again inspired by the featured artwork which is the spyglass uh, from the house and this is a maritime themed cocktail. This is one of my favorite cocktails called the Mai Tai uh, and the Mai Tai has a really nice interesting uh, storied past. And for those of you who may not know, it is sort of the star of the tiki craze. And tiki culture and tiki food and tiki drinks started in Polynesia, made their way. Uh, Hawaii, west coast of California, really where American tiki uh, first was born. And a couple of main influencers of the tiki generation, Trader Vic or Victor Bergeron, uh, and uh, his cocktails were the best, some of the best cocktail cocktails out there. He created some really nice tiki cocktails. And Don the Beachcomber. Uh, Don Beach, also a tiki influential artist of cocktails from that time. And both claim to have invented the Mai Tai. So who knows? I mean, Trader Vic said he invented it in 1944. And Don the Beach said he created it in 1933. Um, 
who knows? But what we do know actually is that the name comes from actually the Tahitian word for good or excellent, which is mayatai, okay, mayatai. Uh, so that's where we get the name of the cocktail itself. And it is a rum-based drink, of course, which a lot of tiki cocktails are based on. And I'd like to just go ahead and make it right now. So first of all, I have my tools. I have my Boston shaker. This is a shaken cocktail, uh, mixing tin and uh, mixing tin and mixing glass put together are called a Boston shaker. If you don't have that, that's okay. I sometimes use a mason jar uh, or a water bottle or protein shaker to shake my cocktail. And then ingredients, I have my rum right over here. I have some nice local Massachusetts rum. Orange curacao is the next ingredient. Uh, it is an orange flavored liqueur, basically. You may know triple sec, which is also an orange flavored liqueur. And you may know blue curacao, which is an orange flavored liqueur colored blue. Orange curacao is an uh, orange flavored liqueur colored orange. Triple sec does not have any color to it. And another main ingredient is our orgiac or almond syrup. This is from a company called Monin, but there are several companies out there that make delicious or orgiac or almond syrup. You could also make your, make your own true almonds syrup, uh, which involves blanching almonds and uh, pureeing them and then straining it out. And it's a lot of work. But what I do when I'm in a pinch, I will actually make a simple syrup with almond milk. So I just do equal parts almond milk and sugar and then add some drops of almond extract. And it actually works really well. And then of course our fresh lime juice because we need to balance out that citrus or that sweet with some citrus. And then a couple of garnishes here. I have some mint. Uh, it's just starting to come up in my garden, some little sprigs of mint. And then of course some real uh, maraschino cherries. These are Luxardo cherries. And we'll just go ahead and make the drink right now. Oh, of course, my glass, I have a nice rocks glass right over here. So first of all, we will take our rum and I'll just angle this down a little bit so you can see my workspace over here. I have my jigger, which is a measuring device that we use when we make cocktails. I am doing two ounces of my rum. And uh, I like to use dark rum you can if you have light rum that's okay but uh, some rum with some age to it is preferable now trader vic and don the beach their mai tai recipes are very different um <laughs> one of them has three different types of rum overproof rum and then one is a little bit on the simpler side i'm doing the traditional simpler one uh, and we have our orange curacao right over here and i'm doing three quarters of an ounce of orange curacao directly into my mixing glass just like that and my lime, I'm just going to slice my lime in half and add the juice of this half of the lime directly into my glass. This will give you about, oh, three quarters of an ounce, half ounce to three quarters of an ounce of juice, depending on how juicy your lime is. And we can't forget the almond syrup or orgiat, as it is properly pronounced, and three quarters of an ounce directly into our Glass. Now we will add ice, ladies and gentlemen. Also another integral ingredient in all cocktails. And we'll fill our cocktail shaker all the way up to the top, okay? This will give us the proper amount of water in our cocktail and the proper temperature for our drink. So I'll pop the top on an angle, slap it down, get that seal, flip it around, make sure the glass is on top when you're shaking your cocktails. And I'll just angle this up a little bit so you can see me shaking. And also a very important part of shaking is to uh, watch people's shaker faces. And I've mentioned this before. So look at my shaker face. And when we shake, we shake for eight Mississippis. And we that's the, what I keep in my head. Shake it awake, don't rock it to sleep, okay? Everyone ready? If you could please shake with me or count with me at least. You can unmute yourselves. You don't have to do your camera. Unmute so that I can hear you counting with me, okay? We're gonna count eight Mississippis. Ready, set, go. One Mississippi. One Mississippi. Two Mississippi. Three Mississippi. 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 All right, good. So now we'll separate the shaker. That takes a little bit of practice separating the shaker. And we will lift up our glass. Oh, look at that ice cube. Isn't that beautiful? I love these nice, clear, big ice cubes slowly dilutes your drink without diluting it too much, keeps your drink nice ice, nice and ice cold. And we'll just strain that out right into that glass. Look at that. And of course, uh, no cocktail is complete without a garnish. All right, so I will angle this down again. All drinks should have garnish because after all, we taste with what first? We taste with our eyes first. 
So that drink needs to look nice, but also that garnish needs to add flavor to the cocktail. So I will just create a little lime wheel, just like that, okay? And we'll just literally place that right on top. I'll add one of my delicious, real Luxardo maraschino cherries, nothing but the best. Please do not use those bright red, fake gross cherries. I hate them. I really, really do. <laughs> These are so good. They're a little bit more expensive, but they're, it's, it's well worth it. Those who've had it can definitely attest to that. And then my mint sprig, what I'll do is I'll just wake it up a little bit. Okay, this is some spearmint. And oh my goodness, look at that. And if I uh, say it in the Tahitian language, my uh, mayatai, uh, which means excellent. And of course, hopefully when you taste this cocktail, you will scream mayatai. Hold on. Mm. Oh, that's so good. Oh my goodness. That's delicious. I haven't had a Mai Tai in a very, 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 very long time. Uh, so this is great. And I will definitely bring this um, to my wife. She's always like, well, what, so what are we drinking tonight? And honey, we've got a Mai Tai. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so I just want to see if anyone wants to unmute and ask any cocktail questions first. <laughs> any cocktail questions before we move on to the, the history part of our history happy hour? Mm. Can I have one, please? That's my question. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely make you one when we, when we can uh, hang out in person. Have you been to the Tiki Bar in San Francisco? How about that? It's, there's like a classic Tiki Bar in San Francisco that really is worth a visit if anyone ever goes to um, San Fran. I think it's still there. Are you so, talking yeah. about Smuggler's Notch? It could be, I don't remember the name. It, that could be it. There are yeah. a few, there are a few Tiki Bars. Um, there's kind of a really great craft Tiki Bar called Smuggler's Notch, um, which has been there for, for a while. Nice. Yeah. Okay, well, um, so we are going to, thank you, Jonathan, so much. We hope to see you at a future event and yes. have you mix us all cocktails. Thank you all. <laughs> so I am going to um, introduce the object that we're talking about tonight. Um, besides the uh, Mai Tai, we have intended to talk to you about an object in the museum's collection. So that object, I will just share my screen. And I'm sorry if I kept anyone waiting in the waiting room as multitasking. I think you're all on now. So um, I'm going to show you this slide right now because the object is related to this gentleman. So um, this is Edward Coffin Jones. And you might, if you listen to the name of our museum, the Roach Jones stuff. House and Garden Museum. Um, this gentleman is our namesake, or you could say the whole Jones family that lived in this house is our namesake because there were several Joneses living here um, from 1851 until about 1935. So I thought I would just tell you a little bit about this gentleman and the object um, that belonged to him that we'll be, that we'll be looking at. Um, so uh, you can see his life dates there. Uh, he moved to 396 County Street, which is the museum's address. After 1850, he bought the house from Mr. William Roach Jr. It was a kind of a direct sale. Um, and uh, he was originally born in Nantucket and then moved to New Bedford um, shortly after birth. And um, Brenda, who's a docent here at the, at the museum, but she can jump in and correct me anytime. <laughs> uh, but based on the research we have, we know that he moved here, uh, moved to New Bedford um, shortly after birth. Um, he uh, lived on Elm Street, which we still have our Elm Street. He lived on Walnut Street before this house. And um, as I said, he purchased this County Street house in 1850. So at that time, he was a fairly wealthy man, one of the wealthiest in New Bedford, similar standing to Mr. Roach. Um, his valued estate at that time was $175,000. That was the, 
the value of his, his estate at that time. He owned multiple properties. Um, this is where what his estate was made up of, multiple properties in New Bedford. He owned several ships or was part owner. And that's a good question for Brenda because I saw one area where it said he was part owner um, versus just outright owner. And he also owned um, several shares of stock. So this is what made up his fortune. Um, he had a, a lot of misfortune. His first wife passed away and their children died in infancy. Uh, Louisa Gibbs was his first, his first spouse, 1835 married. She died in 1839. And then uh, by the time he moved into County Street, um, he, had, he was married to Emma Chambers Nye. They married in 1844 and had three children when they moved into this house. Um, unfortunately, again, the misfortune continues. Um, his wife, um, well, first their newborn, Sarah, dies of scarlet fever, and then his wife, Emma, also passes away. Um, but before she passed away, she had a fourth daughter, and they named, so the, 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 the daughter that passed away was named Sarah. They named the fourth daughter Sarah. So, uh, so in this house, we end up with, with the daughters of Edward Coffin Jones, Emma, Amelia, and Sarah. And that's the order of their age, too, Emma being the oldest. Um, so um, from, from then, um, because Emma died, uh, Mr. Jones did remarry a Mary Luce, but they did not have any children. And supposedly the children were a little skeptical of, of that new mom. <laughs> so, um, so what happens at this point, um, uh, Ed Edward didn't jump right into the whaling industry, but that became his industry. It became what he made his wealth on, and he was very good at it. Um, so that when he was living in this house, he was traveling a lot because of his work. Um, the, the three daughters were taken care of by the domestic staff. That's kind of the life they lived. But he was supposedly a very affectionate father. He wrote them a lot. Um, Amelia herself, his daughter, says how um, he was a, 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 an affectionate father. Um, and su supposedly he was very successful as a, a whaling agent because of um, he just took very good care of his ships and, and, his, um, and his crews. So um, what is an agent? And I love, I love saying this to guests who, you know, all they know is ships and captains. Um, <laughs> so above the captains, there were these agents that put together put together the whaling voyages. And, and we're a whaling town, so a, a lot of you New Bedford residents or, um, already know this, but I'm still going to review what an agent actually did. Um, according to one writer, the agent devoted attention to organizing and financing the voyage, paying the bills, disposing of the product and distributing the earnings, while the captain saw to the day-to-day -day running of the vessel. So, um, so you can imagine um, it was certainly a very busy job. Uh, but he wasn't always on on the ship. I mean, the whaling voyages could be two to three years long. He wasn't out two to three years on on ships as a captain. He was a whaling agent. So um, into I just want to talk a little bit about his success based on his daughter's quotes. And I think I have a quote from um, Amelia and I definitely have a quote from his obit. Um, so his daughter credits his success as an agent to his high quality standard. Basically, he kept his ships in good condition. He provisioned them with the best quality beef and supplies, and he hired very good employees and retained those employees. So if he was hiring the captains, he was retaining these. And, and certainly, when I read a little bit about um, the whaling industry, um, you could have the same ship go out in one, on one voyage, and the next time it goes out, it's a completely different crew, different captain. It's not like the captain stayed with the same ship, and everything could be changed over. Um, not as much so with, with Edward Coffin Jones. So, um, so Mr. Jones, as it says up there, he passed in um, 1880. He had retired from whaling by 1868. Um, and he left this house that I am sitting in, the Roach Jones Duff House and Garden Museum. He left the house to his daughters and wife at the time. So, um, so the house was carried on by Amelia Jones. So Amelia lived here I, something like uh, 81 of her 83 years. I mean, crazy long time. Um, but here's what Mr. Jones's um, obit says. The New Bedford Daily Mercury says uh, in, in his obituary, the open secret to his success is the untiring devotion he gave to his business, seeking that everything was done that he directed 
and as he directed and making himself acquainted with men's character, capacity and antecedents before employing them. It was quaintly said of him that he would not ship a cook till he had found out who was his grandfather. So there you go. There's a little nutshell on Edward Coffin Jones. Um, and the item that we're going to look at, let me see if I can get my slide to work. Oh, as <laughs> I just had to share and give a shout out to the Whaling Museum, because I started to look up some of Edward Coffin Jones' 18 ships that he um, owned. And you can, they have this wonderful database, just check out whalinghistory.org, which is, you can access through the Whaling Museum's website. Um, you can look up, see this Emma Jones, uh, that's one of his ships, obviously named after his, um, his daughter. So he, uh, you can look up these, the whaling voyages and see like the names of the people and the crew. It's just, it's, it's fantastic to see this level of detail. So shout out to them for putting this together. You can see actually it's the crew, crew page that I have up. You can see who was the Cooper and the steward and it's just fantastic. And now to the object at hand, the spyglass. Um, so a little bit about the spyglass and then and then um, our guest is going to uh, talk about it. So a spyglass, this is something you would look through that like a magnifying glass, it gives you a view of the distance, right? This was a gift of Hildegard B. Forbes in 1982. And I do apologize, I did not look up the donor information, but anyone that wants more information on Hildegard, I'd be glad to send that to you. Um, I do have a few docents on this webinar, so you might be interested. This was a spyglass, as I said, owned by Edward Coffin Jones, and you see it there sitting in what we call the captain's rooms. Some, some of the docents call it the captain's room. It's one of the bedrooms set up in the house as a period room, a period bedroom for a man. Um, so in this, this was in this house at the time of Edward Coffin Jones' residency. Uh, you can imagine that they, the Jones put the cupola on this house. It did not exist in the, in the uh, Roach times. The cupola was built by the Jones family. It's an Italianate feature. So um, even though there was a lovely view from the, the fan window or the moon window on the attic space, you could, you could imagine going up one more level to the cupola, the third floor, and using this spyglass, which has an excellent view of the area. So on a clear day, one can see portions of Cape Cod, and I have to trust this, this, uh, <laughs> this is the background on the object, uh, clear, see portions of Cape Cod, the Elizabeth Islands, and Martha's Vineyard, um, and it is just beautiful up there. Uh, Jones family tradition says that Edward Jones used this telescope to watch for whale ships returning to New Bedford. Um, as, as the same research says that William Roach looked out the fan window to see boats coming back in as well. So the view from this house is of the harbor area. In 1871, Sarah Jones, his daughter, used this to watch from the cupola for the Forbes family yacht. Now she married into the Forbes, the famous Forbes family, and their yacht was called the White Cap. So here's a little quote from her in 1871. Um, I have just come down from the, cu the cupola where I've been spying about for something. I went up to see if I could catch a glimpse of the white cap, for I thought she might be somewhere in the region, though she may still be in New York. Mac, which is uh, John Malcolm Forbes, could not get her before as her paint was not dry. I have also been looking at, uh, and somebody correct me, at Noshon. The sun shone very brightly on it and I could, not, I could see the houses very plainly clearly smitten with not only the island, but Mac, John Malcolm Forbes. Sarah writes a letter to her sisters in January of, I'm sorry, 1873, announcing that she has promised to be his wife. So that was an excerpt from a letter from Sarah Jones Forbes as she, as she died, Sarah Jones Forbes. Um, and that is the spyglass. So I'm gonna stop talking about it and turn it over to Jesse who chose this object for us to talk about and look at tonight. Jesse, take it away. And tell us a little yeah. bit about yourself too, please. Jesse Holstein, New yeah, Bedford Symphony sure. Orchestra. Hi everyone. And can everyone hear my voice okay? Say real, okay, great. Let me know if uh, you have trouble hearing. Um, yeah, so I uh, grew up in Western Massachusetts. I went to Oberlin uh, College out in Ohio. Then I went to New England Conservatory and uh, there, I met F. John Adams, who was my theory teacher, who was also the conductor of the New Bedford Symphony at the time. 
and asked if I wanted to start playing in the orchestra. So I said, sure. And uh, after I graduated from NEC, I started working in Providence, helping to run a nonprofit program for children uh, in uh, music. But I became the concert master of the New Bedford Symphony around that time. Uh, this was almost 20 years ago now. And uh, yeah, I've been making the drive on 195 from Providence out to New Bedford ever since. And uh, yeah, and uh, so the reason I chose Spyglass, I actually visited, oh, about a month ago, I had a rehearsal later that day uh, in New Bedford for the symphony. And so I came in a couple hours earlier and walked around and there was lots of uh, really uh, cool things I hadn't hadn't seen before. I'd played it downstairs in the in the parlor a lot, but I hadn't ever been upstairs. And so I was walking around, sort of taking pictures of things, and I saw the spyglass. And um, I remembered a, a a book that I read as a kid, and I still read uh, to this day from time to time. These books by the Belgian. Uh, guy uh, Hergé uh, Tintin or Tintin and there was a book uh, one of the adventures that Tintin went on uh, is called The Secret of the Unicorn and it's about it's a retelling of Captain Haddock is Tintin's uh, comrade and there is a Sir Francis Haddock who is descendant of Captain Haddock, and uh, there's a one of the adventures is a retelling of Sir Francis Haddock on his boat, the, uh, on his ship, the the Unicorn. And uh, there's, I'll, I'll see if I can show you the page. But see, there is Sir Francis Haddock with his spyglass, and I was walking through and I saw it, and I was like, oh yeah, this reminds me of Tintin and Captain Haddock. And so, yeah, and I thought it was really beautiful. Um, I don't even know what kind of wood that is, but um, and I assume that's brass on the ends. Um, and I just thought it was, it was really cool. And I also think as someone that has worn glasses his whole life, I started wearing glasses, I think when I was three or four, that just little convex pieces of glass can magnify something that you're able to see off off in the distance so there's a sort of a romanticized attachment i i was really drawn to um like sinbad the sailor when i was a kid uh and these adventures of tintin and i loved um the idea of pirates and things like that so i uh yeah i thought i would i would choose that uh this item um, I didn't know much about it. I didn't even know much about spyglasses, but it brought me back to that secret of, of the unicorn and um, Sir Francis Haddock looking out from his ship, the, the unicorn and seeing the Jolly Roger. I, uh, yeah, so I wanted to, to talk about that and find out more about it. And um, so, yeah, I, I can't say that I know much about the spyglass, but I just wanted to say that's, that's why I uh, chose it. Um, and yeah, so, uh, that's, that's really all I have to say about the spyglass because I, I don't know much, but I did look up sort of how spyglasses work and how binoculars work. And you have these two convex as opposed to concave. So going out pieces of glass and those you need two because it collects the, the light and brings it into the chamber. And uh, then there's a second glass um, that then that light is filtered through again. And I guess if you rem ever remember looking at through a um, magnifying glass, there's a point at which the, the image appears upside down um, if you're focusing in. And I guess what is used in a spyglass or in binoculars is there's a prism inside the chamber that makes sure that you see it in the right uh, direction. And I just thought it was really cool thinking of the family being up in the cupola um, 
looking out over the ships and uh, seeing, oh, the white caps coming in or different uh, ships out of the sea. But um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions also about the symphony or about anything at all. But I, I'm certainly not an expert at, about spy glasses, but I was just romantically drawn back to that children's book. And my brother and myself collected all of these uh, stories, which maybe many of you read as well, because they've been around uh, since the 40s and 50s. In fact, Hergé died in, um, I believe about 1980, uh, when he was finishing up his final book. He actually never finished. It's called Tintin and the Alpha Art. And, um, some of the earlier Tintins are problematic uh, because of the way they portray uh, uh, Africans um, because Belgium uh, had colonized the Congo and there's a book called Tintin in the Congo, but luckily the uh, Secret of the Unicorn and then Red Rackham's Treasure, which is the story after that, doesn't go into, doesn't, is not problematic, but I just, loved that part of Sir Francis Haddock on his deck looking out through the spyglass, so. Great, that's the, that's the fascinating thing is why one person picks one object in the whole museum. So that was fascinating that that was your link. Um, thank you, Jesse, that's great. I want to sure. definitely open it up for comments or questions from this smart group of people that I know we have here. I'm going to end the recording so you can feel free to speak speak more freely <laughs>